Well, we're going to pray. So anybody would like to kneel, you may. We're going to ask God to be with us in our study. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the freedom we still enjoy in this country to open your Bible and to assemble and worship you without restrictions. Bless us now with your spirit as our teacher. We pray that you will give us new light and new abilities to um, search your word out more effectively that we might be fed with the heavenly manna. Thank you for your spirit, which is our sacred teacher, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So can you hand them, a, they have a sheet? Okay. We're going to have a Sabbath school class on how to study the Bible. We'll have a little bit of instruction for 15 minutes and then, which will have some interaction, but then we're going to try to do an assignment with each of you. How many of you have with you something that has a concordance in it, like a phone or a... Can you search the Bible on your phone? How many people can search the Bible on their phone? One, two, three, four. Anybody have a computer with them? Woo! Yeah, just for searching words. Concordance in your Bible? Oh, that's, 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 my, that's my fault. I should have actually told you that that, would have, that should have been in the email, but that's my, that's, that's my fault. That's okay. We'll do the best that we can. We'll share phones. We'll share phones. And as a matter of fact, how many of you have a smartphone? Okay, I'm going to put this on. How many of you are against smartphones? Yeah. <laughs> okay. there, there's some flip phone people that just, they're just, uh, I'm going to put this on, on the board. This is a, it's a free app you should get on your phone. It's called Blue Letter Bible. That is, uh, is the program that we're going to use. All right, so um, what we're studying this morning is how to study the Bible, um, and there's several different things that we really could look at and eventually will. This morning we're going to talk about word studies, but the Bible should also be studied in its original languages. The Old Testament's written in what language? Old Testament. Hebrew, except for Book of Daniel, is a part of it, and half of it's in Aramaic. And the New Testament's written in what language? Greek. Greek. So we need to have a strong concordance to study that, which is, should be done with your computer or your phone. And you also need, ultimately, a lexicon. Because a lexicon gives a much more detailed definition. So um, we'll talk about that another time. There's two lexicons, one for the Greek, one for the Hebrew. Um, the Bible should also be studied with historical information to know the context of the chapter in the book. And that will greatly illuminate, especially some obscure passages where it says that I say that a woman should never speak in church. Ah, oh, what is that really talking about? You can't understand that unless you go, if you go word, word, word comparing scripture with scripture, you won't get the answer, but if you go contextual study, it makes it clear. And then there's inspired commentaries of the Bible, spirit of prophecy, and then there's just basic Bible commentaries by brilliant men who have studied the Bible. Some of it is correct, some of it is not correct. I'm talking about the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary, um, Matthew Henry's, um, Adam Clark's commentary. Sometimes you'll find some really outstanding things. But what we're doing this morning is word studies. And, um, uh, the foundation for all Bible study is reading the Bible through. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but many people have not read the Bible through at all, or if they have, it's been a long time ago. But I can actually show you um, through nature and scripture that the Bible should be, the story of redemption should be studied from beginning to end at least once a year. Do you believe that? 
Do you know that the, um, that the book of nature tells its story in an annual cycle? That you have spring, summer, fall, and winter, and then it repeats. In the sanctuary, the sanctuary service, which was the plan of redemption again, nature teaches the plan of redemption, sanctuary teaches the plan of redemption, sanctuary tells its story in an annual cycle. At the end of the year, it all starts over again. That tells us that the written word should be read from cover to cover in an annual cycle. We should actually read our Bible through during the year. It might take a year and a half or two years, but we should be working through it. And it's only if you're doing this that you will lay a foundation for word studies. Because as you're reading through the Bible, you will come across things that will just ring like a bell, but you'll say, I don't, I really can get meat from that. And you'll come across other things, you'll say, I don't know what this is saying, but there's something here I need to get and I'm not getting it. And this is how we'll help to unlock it. So today we're gonna have what kind of Sabbath school? <coughs> Hands on for those that have smartphones. And then the rest of you will be fingers on the pages. And um, we're doing word studies, which is a fancy phrase for what? <laughs> Parent scripture, scripture. On your sheet, there's fill in the blank. Here it is. The letters in, the words in white used to write on your sheet. It is the what? First. And what? Highest. Write that down. It's right on your sheet. It is the first and highest duty of every thinking person, every rational being, to learn from the scriptures. What are we supposed to learn? What's the three words? What is truth? Write that down. We're supposed to learn what is truth. And then two, four words in a row, write this down. Walk in the light. First we got to learn what is truth. Then we have to walk in the light and encourage others to follow his example. We should, what does it say right here? Look up for just a second. What does it say right here? What does it say right here? We should day by day. That's that Bible read through, people. We should day by day study the Bible diligently, weighing every thought. And write this down. This is what inspiration tells us. Comparing scripture with scripture. There are people that will tell you that this proof text message, comparing scripture with scripture, is not the best way to study the Bible. They'll tell you, don't do that. You're going to lead yourself astray. Inspiration says that we should do what? Weigh every thought and do what? Comparing scripture with scripture. With divine help, we are to form our opinions. What does it say here? In, in, for, ourselves. for ourselves. Part of our assignment today, I'm going to ask each of you to do it by yourself. And part of it, we're going to do as pairs. And we are, as we are to answer for ourselves before God. You can't trust to me. You can't trust to a general conference president. You can't trust to an Andrews theologian. You can't trust to your husband, your wife, your son, or daughter. You've got to find out for yourself. The second phrase here that shows that this is how we, that we should study this method, uh, there's several statements. Here's fun, uh, Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 187. This is Spirit of Prophecy. It says, the Bible is its own, what's that word there? What does that mean? Anybody know? What does that mean? It, it, it it's only explains itself. Okay, write this down, capital words, right on your sheet it says, one passage, write down one passage, will prove to be a what? What's it say there? A key. A key that will do what? Unlock other passages. Write that down. Here, inspiration is telling us that while we're comparing scripture with scripture, that one passage in the Bible is going to be a key to unlock other passages. And in this way, light will be shed upon the, catch this here, what does it say? Enemy. Write that down. So, so in the Bible, you're reading a story, and the Bible is saying something very simple, but underneath that story, there's a hidden meaning. That's what we want to get, is the hidden meaning. The hidden meaning of the word. By comparing different texts, write that down, comparing different texts, treating on the same subject, Viewing their bearing on every side, it says the, write this down, true meaning of the scriptures. So there is a false rendering, a false interpretation, and then there's a true meaning. It says that the true meaning of the scriptures will be made what? Evident. Write that down. So, 
So is there divine endorsement for doing word studies? Comparing scripture with scripture? How many of you guys already do that? Okay, good. So we have the experts here. It's another statement on your sheet right there in the middle. And um, it says, observe system in the study of the scriptures in your family. This is Child Guidance, page 511. It is impossible to estimate the good results of one hour, even a half an hour, of each day devoted to cheerful, social manner to the word of God. Make the Bible its own expositor, bringing together, what does it say there, those four words in capital letters? So you really have to start looking up, take a look at least of all of those texts, because sometimes you skip, and that's the problem with the Bible concordance in the back. This is what they call an abridged, um, an abridged uh, concordance, and you need to have a exhaustive concordance. All right, let's move on. There are, the title of your sheet says Guidelines for Word Studies, and we're going to give you just three guidelines in our Sabbath School class. The first guideline is this. You have to use the right version of the Bible. Do you believe that? Yes. The question um, on number one is, why do many scholars favor the King James Version over other popular versions of the Bible? And I'm going to give you two answers for that. There's a lot of Bible versions out now. I think it approaches a hundred different versions. How was the Bible given originally? You guys know? It was given orally, but where did it come from? God did what? What did he do? And what did he do? Okay, that's okay. You're asking a hard question. Let's read it out the Bible. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any. For the prophecy came not in old time by the. Now stop there. That word will in the Greek, it means by the choice, the determination, by the decision of men. That's not how it came. It says, but, what does it say here? Holy of God spake as they were what? So where did the scripture come from originally? Holy Spirit did what? It, it inspired men. It inspired men. Holy men. That's a very good point. I see I have it capitalized. Holy men. Holy men. Now watch. The Holy Spirit comes in. There's a big dispute now. They say, was it thought inspiration or word inspiration? That's they say, well, yeah, did, did it dictate it to them? I believe the Holy Spirit gave them both thoughts and words. The Holy Spirit gave them both. That's my position. That's how it originally came. But how do we have it today? We, those words that were given were copied by other men. Do you believe that? They call them manuscripts. One man would tell another and they copied it down. And in order to have accurate copies today, we need to understand that copies can only be made of what? Words. Of words. It's a very important point. In order for us to have an accurate version, they can't, we can't say what the thoughts were that the Holy Spirit gave these men. We can only say what the words were that they wrote. And I'm going to show you something here. Um, the King James Version and the New King James, this is the first reason. The first question is, why do some scholars say we should use the King James Version? The first answer, and if you want to write just briefly, just write this. The King James Version and New King James are more accurate. If you want to write the long version, on, this is on number, question number one. number one, you can write this. The King James and New King James attempt to copy the Hebrew and Greek words from superior manuscripts. That's why when you do a word study, you have to use either the King James, which is the best, or the New King James, which is pretty good, it's pretty close. Because the, look, at this, look at this slide here. They're saying that the translators tried to translate these, what does it say here? The interlinear Bible, which is based on the Hebrew and Greek. New, Amer New American Standard Bible will tell you why that's not good and King James and New King James. These Bibles, they said, we're going to tell you what the authors thought. 
and we're going to write out their thoughts. And that's all these other Revised Standard Version, NIV, all these other versions here. These over here, Living Bible, and the message, they're not even trying to get the thought. They're just doing what? What do they say here? What are they doing? Paraphrase. Brothers and sisters, you're just getting into just, just a big cloud now. You, how can we know what someone's thoughts were? We have no real way of knowing. The most accurate way to do it is to copy their what? Words. <coughs> words. And which two versions of the Bible is a literal translation of the Hebrew and Greek words? Okay, and you also see New American Standard Bible. I'm going to talk about that just for a minute. And then we're going to get to our first exercise. So a first reason why we need to use King James and New King James is because they are word-for-word -word studies from the Hebrew and Greek. The Greek, they use the Textus Receptus, and the Hebrew, they use the Masoretic Text. By the way, the vast majority of manuscripts, 85 90% of them, are these two. Of all the manuscripts they can define, 95% of all that they can find are these. Textus Receptus and the Masoretic for Hebrew. 95%. All of these versions here are based on the 5% of manuscripts that disagree with the 95%. So, um, so just think if, if there were thousands of manuscripts copied 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, and we have 95% of them agree and 5% disagree. What do you think is the accurate ones? The 95%. That's what everybody must have been using. But all of these versions are based on another set of manuscripts. And this is attempts to be word-for-word -word copy, but it's from a wrong manuscript. And that's why we don't use a New American Standard Bible for word studies. Did you catch what I just said? Did you guys follow that? Did, did I lose you? <laughs> okay. This is actually going to, I'm, it's going to be developed into a whole PowerPoint program, but in the 1870s... Just, just a, in the bulletin I have a paper that kind of covers some of these. All right. Well, I, I, just to let you know. Okay, I, so I'll move off of this. In, in the 1870s, there was a big push to revise the King James Version. In 1875, and they formed a committee, and this committee met for 20 years in secret. And two of the most influential men on that committee was named Westcott and Hort. These men were actually Roman Catholics. They were sympathizers of the Roman Catholic Church. They actually worshipped, they were devout worshipers of Mary. And when they met in this committee, they did not update the King James Version. They did what? It says they actually changed it according to those, those uh, Catholic um, manuscripts, the, um, the, the Greek manuscripts that were from origin. And so they changed it. And from this revision, the Revised Standard Bible, Right, revised Standard Version, we have all the other Bibles. What is the result? Words are missing. Here, New American Standard, from word for word translation, it agrees with the NIV from a false manuscript. And what word did they take out here? Holy. They took it out. It's been removed dozens and dozens of times. So how can you do a word study with a Bible where many words are missing? You cannot. This is a very important point, brothers and sisters. When you move away from King James, you have made it almost impossible to compare Scripture with Scripture. You cannot prove Adventism with the Bible that's not King James or New King James. Brother Ski, I think you made that up. Here's, a, here's your second reason. Write this down for number one. Why do many scholars favor the King James above other versions? Here's the answer. It is impossible to compare Scripture with Scripture with the popular version. That's the second answer for number one. The first answer was it, King James, the New King James was based upon a word-for-word -word study of Hebrew and Greek, this, or it's more accurate. The second reason is it's impossible to compare scripture with scripture with any other version. And I'm going to show you just one example for NIV. In the King James Version, the word patience appears how many times? But in the NIV, it appears 15 times. Grace, is that an important subject to study? Yes. I mean, even the Sunday believers believe in grace, okay? King James Version, 159 times. In the NIV, they took out 39 references. 
Now watch. These are general things that are going to get more pointed as we go down. And the more pointed the doctrine, the more changes of the words. Righteousness is 289 times in King James. They took out 70 plus references of the word righteousness out of the NIV. What about tabernacle? Is that an important subject? They took out almost 200 references for tabernacle. They changed the word commandments. They went from 168 times it's mentioned in the King James Version. The word commandments is only mentioned 20 times in the NIV. They changed it to precepts or principles or anything but a commandment is something different from a principle. If God says, I give you a commandment to perform and I give you a principle to perform, command is more direct. It's more forceful. And let me tell you something. The little nuance changes in the Bible changes its meaning. It changes its meaning. All right, let's move on. All right. Our second principle. Okay, here's an assignment. This is question number two. Um, question number two, the, the principle number two for studying word to word studies. It says that you have to look up different tenses of a word and be sure to look up what? Related words. Okay. So if you're going to study the word righteous, you have to look up different forms of that word righteous. So in, in, the, in the Bible, um, what other words do um, other forms of the word righteous come in? Very good. Write that down. Write down under, under, under question number two. List the different tenses and forms of the word righteous. Write righteousness. Um, just. Just is a related word and it comes from the same Greek. It's the same idea, but it's a different word. But you're right. You're right. Just would be um, a related word. That comes in the second part. I'll give you an answer. Righteously, that is correct. Righteously. Write that down. R-I-G-H-T-E-O-U-S-L-Y. Righteously is in the Bible. You'd have to look that word up too. You might not figure this one out. Righteousnesses. That's in the King James Version. You would have to look that up too. So when you're doing a word study, you have to try to look up the word in all of its different forms. And you'll find that many of those words come from the same original Hebrew and Greek word. In a blue letter Bible, um, Bible app, in um, almost any Bible software, if you start to type a word out, if you type R-I-G-H-T and you put an asterisk behind that, R-I-G-H-T, right with an asterisk, it will list every word that starts R-I-G-H-T. It'll list righteous, right, righteously, righteousness, righteousnesses. It'll list it for you. So again, you can't do that with a paper Strong's Concordance. Brothers and sisters, you got to step into the 21st century and get either a smartphone, smartphone or a laptop if you want to study the Bible. We don't, with Trump in office, we don't have time to be fooling around with paper concordance. We got we to move quickly. So we, need to, so we need to look at the word in every form. The other thing is we need to look up, what does it say here? Related words. Related words. Say you're reading through your Bible and you come to this text. It says, for as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the what? Garden. Garden calls the things that are sown to spring forth, so the Lord God will, get, will cause what? And praise to spring forth before all nations. That's in the last days. God's going to have his righteous character seen before all nations. You say, oh, that's an interesting text. It says that as the garden causes the things to grow, so righteousness. So you want to study... Garden Lessons on Righteousness by Faith. What words would you look up in the Bible if you were trying to find Garden Lessons on Righteousness by Faith? This is, this is a question. All right. Okay, stop right there. She is correct. She said, so... 
S O W. All right, somebody give me another word. That's another one. That is correct. Reap. Plant. Somebody said harvest. What else? Another one. Give me, I want a dozen words. Rain. Very good. That is a very good word. You have to look up seed. What else? Eden? Okay, I'll put Eden on the list. Grain. That's another good word, Winnie. Plow? So they're all good words? Huh? Gardens, plural? Oops. I can't see my... You get the idea. You get the idea? If you were putting together a Bible study and you came to this text and you say, oh, the Bible is talking about how to... Um, that just as the garden causes things to grow, that that's how righteousness is going to... I need to study how the garden causes things to grow. And so you go in the Bible and you start looking up related words. And you... There's another good one. That's a good one, Daddy. <laughs> yeah. Bible doesn't use the word weeds, but it does use the word tares. And... Um, Yes. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That's a, that's, a, that's a good one. The word soil only occur, occurs once in the Bible. So you have to use another word. What's equivalent? There it is. That's a very good word, brother. We got, we got four parables about the seed was sown into different types of ground. And so... So you can see that if you came across this text and you wanted to do a word study on it, you would um, have a lot of different ways to go. Now listen, you're looking up text in the Bible. Let's say that the, you're looking up the word um, so, and you find this in the Bible 37 times. How do you know which of those texts to use in your Bible study? Context, Context of it. And, and, and you, you obviously, this, may, this might sound like it's ridiculous, but you can only use texts that you really understand. You know, sometimes you read a text and you're like, hmm, I don't really know what that's saying. That's what I call a kick out. You, you don't use that text in your study. I've had people give Bible studies and they list the text and then You'll say, brother, what does that mean? <laughs> That's a good text, though. It's a good one. <laughs> it's a good one. I'm like, no. If you don't understand it, it's a kick out. It's a what? Yeah. You don't put it in your study. And then when you left with, say, you have 37 texts on so, you end up with seven texts. That you say, I understand. Then you have to organize them. Which one will you mention first? Which is the clearest? And what you do to make a Bible study, brothers and sisters, is you create a question that that text is the answer. And then you have a little Bible study. Does that make sense? I hope you're paying attention because you're about to do this in about five minutes. All right. Now, I've learned over the years from teaching this class that different people have different abilities. Sorry for moving so much. Different abilities to discern um, the truth in a scripture. Do you hear what I said? Different people have different discriminatory powers. Some can look at a text and say, I don't know what that's saying, and they can draw it out. And other people, if you explain it to them, I got it, but I didn't see it before. Some people, they can't see it. And that ability comes from God, and it comes from practice. The Holy Spirit opens the scriptures, and the more that you look at scriptures, you can discern the different shades of meaning. And everybody can't do it initially. You have to spend time looking at scripture and saying, what does this scripture mean? I, if I had more time, I'd give you six Bible texts on the second coming. And I'd ask you to put them into three categories. And I see people struggle. Other people, 
That's the manner of his coming. That's who he's coming for. That's the description of his coming. I see it. Two texts, two texts, two. And other people, they're looking at it and they can't. But when you show it to them and say, oh yeah, I see that. That is describing the manner of his coming. So at this picture here, there are six hidden words. How many of you can see four of those words? You see four. Take a look at the picture just for a second. You see four words. Okay, raise your hand. We got two people. If I show them to you, you'll say, yeah, I see it. <laughs> you see four? Okay, here's sun, S-U-N. Oh, it screen's too dark. <laughs> Screen, screen's too dark, brother. <laughs> you must. <laughs> All right, forget that, forget that. But the whole point, the whole point, listen, shh, the whole point is that when you're looking at the Bible, shh, when you're looking at the Bible, some people immediately, they, oh, yeah, that's what that meant. And other people, you have to pray and ask the Lord, show me what this is saying. This morning, I sat down the scriptures, I sat down on my computer, and I put together a mini study on what I would do. This is four question study on garden lessons and righteousness by faith. And I, and I made this little study. What is the seed? Luke 8, 11 says, the seed is the word of God. When should it be sown? Ecclesiastes 11, 6 says, in the morning will I sow my seed. And in the evening, I will, uh, I forgot how it is. I, I will not withhold my hand. Very good, plenty. And three, what does the Bible say about the purity of what is sown in the heart soil? Deuteronomy 22, 9 says that thou shalt not sow your field with diverse seeds. What does that mean? In terms, of, in terms of the seed being the word of God. Different books. Different books? Different versions of the Bible. Or other religious books that contradict the Bible. There are songs in the hymnal about the secret rapture. And you're singing that. It's talking about when I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun. That's contra. You're sowing the the soil of your heart with diverse seeds. Next question. What is the ultimate goal of this sowing process? Open your Bibles to Hosea 10, 12. Hosea 10 and verse 12. We're going to all read it together. Hosea 10 and verse 12. Guys, there? We won't put them all on the screen. Hosea 10 and verse 12. Hosea is hard to find. It's after Daniel. In most Bibles. <laughs> okay, Hosea 10, verse 12. You ready? Let's read it together. It says, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your hollow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. So the ultimate goal of this sowing, which cannot be done if the ground is hard, the ground must be broken. It's that God, it says the Lord will come and he will rain righteousness upon you. So the ultimate purpose of, of sowing this seed in our hearts is that our character change, that we become like Jesus. So that is a mini study. It's easy for me to do because I've been doing it for 25 years. I, 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 this is what I do for a living. So it's easier for me to do it than for you to do it, to come up with the question and it's a Bible text. This is a really simple little study. Could have made it very involved. But each of us need to have this ability. If we knock on someone's door, bump into somebody, and they say, can you give me a Bible study on faith? You don't have to go. You go, you go look at your amazing facts. There is no amazing fact study on faith. You got to make one. You should be able to put together 
five questions or eight questions and ask, shouldn't you? You think so? Should we? Should we be able to? Yes, we should. All right. All right. And so we've come to our assignment. Uh -uh. We are on number three. It says, retain only. This is your guideline for comparing scripture to scripture. Retain only helpful text. It says, text that you do not understand or that do not add new thoughts to the study should be left out. Sometimes you have texts that they both say the same thing. You don't put those in. <coughs> Questions should be developed with the text as the answer. So in making a Bible study, you create a question, and the text is the answer to the question. OK? So on the back of this sheet of paper, I would like for you to prepare a Bible study with five questions and five answers on being slothful. Now, to help you with that, since many of you don't have your Bible with you, I'm going to put it on the screen. This is a PC study Bible. And you can see that the word slothful occurs in the Bible in the King James Version 15 times. So I'd like for you to turn your sheet over. And what we're doing right now for our hands-on Sabbath school class is you're going to make a little Bible study on what the Bible says about being slothful. And I want you to look through. There's only 15 texts that you can choose from here unless you want to use a related word. If you want to use a related word, you can. I'm not limiting to you to this. But I just would have to bring the related word on the screen. And to make it easy for you, what other Bible word is equivalent to sloth, slothful? Sloth. <laughs> Who said that? That's right. Ding, 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 ding. She gets an extra, an extra a roll with her, uh, her dinner. That is correct. I'm going to just put that on the board. That is correct. This is an old English word. See that? It's sluggard. And how many texts are there? Six, I think. So I'm going to put slothful back up. And start with slothful. But, you, but as you go through slothful, you're going to find a slothful text, and the next verse says sluggard. And that would have led you to, that's another way the Bible talks about. And most people in the church today are slothful or sluggard. But how do you make a Bible study on that? So look them up in the Bible. And I'd like everybody to work on their own. Does anyone feel really, really, really handicapped and they want a partner to work with? Okay, I think you can do it. I think you can do it. Okay, so on the... You, you finished already? No. <laughs> well, there are a lot of stuff written down. So take a few minutes now. Do you understand what you're doing? Do you understand? You're making a five-question Bible study on what the Bible says about being slothful. Five questions. Right on the back, I want you to write five questions, and I want you to put the five Bible texts in the order that you would take somebody through. All right, so I'm going to move around. If you only can come up with three questions, just do three questions. But you've got to look at those texts and say, is this a useful text? And what does it say? What is the text saying? You might want to pause the camera for a few minutes and okay, because it's just going to be silence and it might be disconcerting to whoever's looking at it. Mm -mm. I'm 
I'm going to make it easy for you. If any of you want to put what the original language definition is, you can make that one of your questions. If you want to look it up in your phone, what, it, what the word slothful in the Greek means or slothful in the Hebrew, it's a good place to start a study. But if you don't have Hebrew or Greek, we can find the hidden meaning by comparing scripture with scripture. All right. How many of you found it was, how would you describe it? Easy, medium, hard, difficult, very difficult. Once I got into it, it was better. Wasn't bad. I guess time is hard for the time given. <laughs> it was hard for the time given. You need, you need more time to do to. I, I usually, I go through, like if I was going to do a study on a slot, I would go through every single text and then read them all in context and then compare scripture with scripture and then they're saying, well, they can get the slot while he's asleep. Way. Yeah, it, it, more detail. You need more time to, to do that, that in depth of a study. Is that what you guys thought that it was just it, the time constraint made it more difficult? If you had a half an hour or an hour, you could, it'd have been easier? Yeah. So do yes. Quality, yeah. Yeah. Yes, no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Finding. All right. Well, who would like to uh, share their questions and answers that they had? All right, sister. All right. Uh, the first question is, what is the way of a sloth man? That's probably 1519. And it says, the way of a sloth man is as a head of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. Mm -hmm. Number two, how is he in his word? Proverbs 189. He also that is slothful in his work is brother, is brother to him that is a great waster. Number three. Okay, well, can we read that question again? What was your question for 18 now? How is he in his work? How is he, how, how is he in his work? And he said he's a brother, he is a great waster. Does anyone else, okay, hold, your, hold that right there. Anybody else had another question for that text? What was your question? Mine is, is being slothful a burden to others. Okay, and use that answer. What did you have? What is the characteristic of a sloth? What is the of a sloth? Okay, and, and I put, what is the close relative of the sloth? So again, same text, but a little adjustment in the question makes it clearer. He's actually a brother to him who's a great waster. So it's almost like brothers kind of have the same attributes. They have the same dad, um, but he might, he might be a medium waster. Okay, next question. Thank you for that. Number three. <coughs> if he does not work, what is his hand doing? Mm -hmm. Proverbs 19.24. A slothful man hideth his hand in his bosom and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. He's on his cell phone. <laughs> that brother's on a tablet. He's had in his hand. That's a good one. What will his hand do? That's kind of an answer. Anybody else use that text and had another question? What, did what does a slothful person do? What does he do? She said, what does his hand do? Okay, next question. Number four, the desire of the slothful does what? Proverbs 21, 5. The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. Okay, anybody else who used that text? What did you put for that text? What's the danger of being slothful? What's the danger? Someone else, what was your question? Is being slothful the pathway to death? Is being slothful the pathway to death? My question was for that text, what is the slothful man's problem? I used that as my very first question because that's the only text that it actually says he refuses to put his hands to work. So again, the question, um, it, it guides, it leads for the answer. 
And it takes some meditation, some time to say, well, what would be the best question? Because it's what you're drawing out of the text. You have one more? In what way should the slothful turn? This is God, he who says the will. That, that he be not slothful, but follows of them who faith and patient inherit the promise. I like how you brought that to the climax, to the solution at the end. Anybody else use the Hebrews 12, Romans 12, 11? What was your question? Will the yes. slothful inherit the promises of God? One more time. Will the slothful inherit the promises of God? Will the slothful inherit the promise? <laughs> that was, that, that was a, Hebrews 6, 12? 6, 11, and 12. I didn't have both verses. You used them both for that answer? Okay. That you've been as slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So, and what, what was the characteristics of a non slothful person? Somebody that's not slothful, what are the characteristics? Okay, that that's good. And, and it, Hebrews 6 12 also did it they, they went together on, on, both of, on, your, on that same question? Hebrews 6 12. Okay, who, who had other texts and questions? Okay, give me one of your questions and texts that you use. I had, uh, is being slothful a Christian characteristic? I use Romans 12, verses 10 to 18. 10 to 18? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll put that up on the screen for a minute. Be kindly affectionate one to another, not slothful in business, rejoicing in hope. So you just left... Uh, 17, 18, 19, all the way down to 18 is just kind of like traits of being a Christian. And so not slothful is... Slothful wouldn't be one. Slothful is not being one because it says not slothful. Okay. Who had a, a, another solution text to the problem of slothfulness? Did anybody have another solution text? My question was, are the bridegroom, which you come, they find them slumbering and sleeping. I, I connect, are they, are they slothful by slumbering and sleeping? Mm. I think the question was, five of them are that characteristic in them, slothful, but they didn't inherit the promises of Hebrews 6, 12. But actually, they all slumbered they and all slept. They all slept. So yeah, yeah. Point. But five... <coughs> Yeah, that's a that's a whole deep that's a whole different twist here now, because um, I think sleeping and slothfulness are related but not identical. Some people are very active and they're asleep. They're doing the wrong things, but they're busy as can be. All right, who else had a solution text? Paraphrase a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. Yes, that was. Yeah, that's uh, that's That's Proverbs 24. They can go together. They, they can go together. Um, and um, and some people, um, that was my original picture. And some people, this is how slothfulness manifests themselves. They sleep in. They sleep, they sleep in. They, they nap in the afternoon. They're supposed to be working. I had a question about that at night. I cited Proverbs 26, 14, Proverbs 19, 15, and Proverbs 20, 13, which all talks about sleeping and waking up. Oversleeping. Sleeping too much. Yes, because that a little slumber, a little folding of hand is right in that same passage of... Um, it links the two together there but Proverbs 24 says if you've gone by the feel of a slothful man it's all overgrown and then it comes down and says a little folding of the hands a little slumber That's Proverbs 24. That's, that's, yeah, that's right. It comes right at the end, which, which, which was my second question. So, okay, so, so you get the idea that 
the, one of the big challenges is the question that you have to search for the right question and you have to understand the meaning of the text or which part of the text you're trying to emphasize. Yes, Debbie. I just want to share one that we always Please. did with the kids when they were growing up. How can one counteract slothfulness with hunger? Second, that's the lines 310. If any would not work, neither should that to write that down. That's Second Thessalonians, which one? Thessalonians 3.10. How to combat slothfulness with hunger. <laughs> you know, my wife tells me that, honey, if you don't get much done, you're not going to get lunch. <laughs> so me and Ben are working hard. How to combat slothfulness with hunger. All right. We're going to close our time. Is up. I, I did use Slugger and... Um, my last question is, what lessons do ants teach those to remedy laziness? And the two lessons were, focus on being a self-starter. It says, not having guide over seer or ruler. And then the second part was, they provide their meat in the summer for the harvest. You have to plan ahead for what is coming. That was the two suggestions in Proverbs 6. Um, the counsel of Solomon to the sluggard. So again, and, I, and you want to end on your Bible study with some solutions. You just don't want to have, hey, he says the lion's without. He says this, he won't put his hand to his mouth. But you, in the end, you're saying, okay, God bless you. Wasn't that a wonderful study on, on sloth? Let's pray. No, you want to... Uh, um, present something that's solution oriented. All right, any comments or questions before we end out our Sabbath school class? Oh, I forgot. There's one last thing on the list. And then we'll get your comment right here, brother. It says, homework assignment. Let's go to that. It's on the screen. This is your work study homework assignment for when we meet next month. You bring your assignment back. Or you can email me and I can discuss it with you or you can call me. Here's a principle we didn't talk about. It says the language of the Bible should be explained according to his what? Unless or what? So you're reading through the Bible and you come across this text and it talks about a little horn having the eyes of a man. <coughs> Do horns have eyes? So this is obviously a symbol. Is that correct? So the question is, what? Do the eyes represent? You keep reading through your Bible, you come to this text, and it says that they saw a lamb that had been slain having seven horns, and what? Seven. Does anything, is any lamb or any animal have seven eyes? No. So it's obviously symbolic. So this is your question for the next time we meet, or you can just email me or ask me. I want somebody to find out what do eyes symbolize in the Bible? So just make a little study, four or five questions, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, that explain what eyes. And if you do that study, you will be able to tell people why the little horn was described as having eyes of a man. You'll be able to tell them what that means from the Bible. If you do this little study, you'll be able to say why Jesus is represented as having seven eyes. Because the Bible explains itself. And every time you do a little study like this, your ability to draw out the meaning of text will improve. All right? That's it. You got a comment, brother, you want to say? Yeah, yeah. Usually when, uh, I was going to say, when I, when I do a Bible study with somebody, I always look at that text for what Jesus says about the seven days. Yeah. You go to that first. That you want to put it in there? Somewhere in there. That's very good. That's very good. Because in the Gospels, Jesus touches on a lot of different things. And people don't have any resistance to Jesus. You know, you can, you can start with that and say, you know what? Jesus said this about that. And it, it actually will help. All right, let's go ahead and kneel. We're going to ask the Lord to, to be with us as we close out our, our first service. We're praying. Grace, I work as Father in heaven. We... Thank you that we still have the word of God today and that you have instructed us
to compare scripture with scripture, and that one passage will be a key that will unlock others, we pray that you will bless every man and woman that's come here to church today, that you will give us a new capacity, a new ability to um, search out the hidden meaning, the true meaning of scripture by comparing scripture with scripture. We pray that your spirit will give us time, will remind us to take time to um, acquire this skill while we're learning how to do many different things. Help us to learn this skill so that we won't have to have showbread handed to us by a priest, but that we might be able to have manna straight from heaven where the Spirit can teach us in our own devotional time and give us the strength and grace that we'll need for the crisis that's coming. Bless us as we separate and prepare for our second service. Give us the blessing that we stand in such great need of because we've asked it in Jesus' name. Amen.